Well, I hope you're having a good morning worshiping the Lord together. And uh, I'm not going to talk about what's going on Tuesday. So uh, Tom told me to talk about it so that it does rain. Because we need rain. So I'm not going to tell you. You could get, talk to Paul, talk to Christy. Uh, they'll let you know what's happening. So I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be fun. And I hope you do have a good 4th of July this week. And uh, we are thankful for the country that we live in. We're going through some significant issues. We have been in our country. That's nothing new. But they are getting, uh, I think, more significant and more difficult to navigate. So we need to continue to pray for our country. Um, and uh, yeah, our, our son Titus, he is the expert on the presidents. And uh, he is related to a president by the way. I am not uh, related to a president, but my son is. So you, you have to ask him. We're re- I'm related to outlaws and gunfighters and stuff in our family, but ask Titus afterwards who he's related to. So, But he is the expert on all of that, including basketball. So if I have questions about the presidents or basketball, I'll go ask my son, and he'll know. Well, I'm thankful to be able to get to God's Word this morning and to worship the Lord through His Word. Thankful for Atticus reading the Word. That is a time that we worship the Lord through reading. And this is a time that we hear what the Word of God says and means. So turn with me, again, it's been a while, to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4. So we return to the study here in Paul's letter to the Ephesians. We, we did a series on the deity of Christ, looking at the fact that Jesus is God, very God. And it, what stirred me was a statement by Paul there in chapter 4, verse 13, that is his phrase there, the knowledge of the Son of God. And so we, in a sense, kind of did a, a long exposition of a few words. So I want to pick back up here, and I want to look at over the next few weeks, verses 17 through 24. And here we begin to examine a foundational theological text which really sets the foundation for the rest of Paul's letters. Uh, This is almost kind of the center of the letter in a sense. And everything that follows is connected back to this passage here. So the great apostle has reminded them, he has reviewed for them, he has detailed to them the gospel of Jesus Christ, which, by the way, we can never review enough. Uh, And we are prone to forget that which is most important, and that which is most important is the gospel. I was reminded that of this this morning when Cameron preaching to our, our preaching class. And Paul has detailed the gospel, including many of its beautiful implications and the reality that though we were once dead in our sin, remember in chapter 2, we have been made alive in Christ by His Spirit. We have been regenerated. We have been born again. We have been given new life in Him, though we were once dead and we were dead sinners. Paul has been telling us, the Lord has been telling us through his word that the Lord loves us, that he owns us, uh, that we have been made one new man, that is the church, the body of Christ, that you are no longer a stranger, an alien to the covenants of promise. Now you are a fellow citizen, you are a saint, you are a member of the household of God. All these beautiful results implications and truths that flow out of the gospel itself. So God is doing a new thing. He's doing a new thing in you, and he has, and he's doing a new thing through you, the church. So here in our fourth chapter, and and it's always good to remind ourselves there's no divisions as we have in the English text. Uh, Sometimes that that makes it even more confusing. Uh, This is one letter here by Paul. The apostle, though, has turned a little bit different direction here uh, from gospel theology to the therefore section. And you know when Paul does that, he's going he's gonna to begin to point the finger at you. He's going to step on your toes. He's going to put some weight upon you that you need to respond to what he has said. 
That's what Paul does. That's what the apostles do. They ask the question, really, how do we live in light of what we have learned, what we have experienced? It reminds me of the famous Christian apologist, Francis Schaeffer, in the 20th century. He titled his book, How Should We Then Live? You know, that's a good question to ask. We don't want to just know the gospel. We need to ask ourselves, how do we live in light of what we do know? How does that affect us in our life, in the workplace, how we view this world? And Paul provides the answer. So in a nice kind of way to to organize the whole book, the first half, the first three chapters are the gospel, the content of the gospel. The second set of three chapters, chapters four, five, and six, are all the practical, right? Therefore, what do you do now? How do you live So you have the indicatives in the first half. That is, this is what's true. And then Paul gives you the imperatives. This is now what you need to do. Or you have doctrine first and then duty. Or you have the gospel first and then gospel conduct. And that's how the gospel flows. Remember, the gospel is the power of God for salvation. And the gospel is that which empowers us in sanctification. And it it shows us how to live, and it is the fuel by which we live the Christian life. So these first 16 verses of chapter 4 we looked at was a focus on walking in gospel-worthy unity. Paul begins in this practical section saying, I want you to walk together, to be unified as the church. You've been made one new man, you're now the body of Christ. Uh, Chapter 2 earlier, he said, not only has he made you alive, but verse 6, verse 5, he has made you alive together with Christ. And I think Paul is emphasizing that word together. You are not only given life in Christ, you're given it with brothers and sisters. He, He has redeemed many believers here. And he wants us to be unified. And then, Starting here in verse 17 and really going through the beginning of chapter 6, there's a great focus on living a gospel-worthy life by walking in love. So I always think of two main things in the second half of the book. Unity and love. Unity and love. Paul focuses a lot on those things and especially on love. So he wants us to live this reality out. He wants you to live in light of what you already know about the Lord Jesus Christ and what he's done for you on the cross. And as he's told us in chapter 1, not only what Christ has done, but what our Trinitarian God has done, that the Father has done, the Spirit has done, and the Son has done in your salvation. God himself, our Trinitarian God, has worked this great salvation now Paul says, live this out. Live in in light of this reality. So let me just read this section for us. Chapter 4, verse 17. Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, due to the hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learn Christ. Assuming you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. It's a beautiful passage, and it's a foundational one. Here, just in verse 17, the beginning in this section, Paul provides for us the need, the importance, the place, the necessity of what we call sanctification that is growing to become more like our savior we have a kind of summary here 
a doctrinal outline, a, a synopsis of sanctification for the Christian. Um, what Christian growth looks like, if you were to kind of examine it a little bit like an engineer and, and look at the parts, the nuts, the bolts, and how it works, Paul does that for us here. And he shows us our place in sanctification, which we're going to find is very different than our place in justification, which was the work of God and the work of God alone. So his summary here in verses 17 through 24, they're kind of like pegs that you can, you can attach everything else that follows back to what he says here in these verses, 17 through 24. Because he's going to give a lot of, of specific, practical instruction. And with that, a lot of conviction <laughs> as well. And a lot of help. And I love, I love how the Apostle Paul gets so specific He's a very practical man. It seems strange. It seems hard at times to be theological and intellectual and understanding the truths of Scripture and yet be also a practical person. <laughs> Paul, he's good. He's balanced. He's able to do all of that for us. And so here we have a great summary of the subject of sanctification. And I love how he'll summarize it. He summarizes it this way in verse 22, that you put off your old self, that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and then you do what? You put on the new self. Did you know there's a new self? You have a new self? Not physically yet. I know that you're, you're in t waiting for that moment with a new body but you do have a new self, and that's what he's going to get at here. A summary here, putting off the old man and putting on the new man. So I want us to look at verse 17 and this idea of sanctification. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. I want us to examine this very subject, and really where Paul begins in verse 17 and sanctification is one of the great doctrines of the Bible, one of the great doctrines of the New Testament that the apostles talk about. So let us first examine the meaning of sanctification, and then I want us to look at three principles regarding sanctification from our passage. So let me just first begin with the meaning of sanctification. Some of you may have never heard that word. You're saying the pastor is speaking in tongues again. You know, what is he doing? What is this? This Christian vocabulary. Sanctification essentially means to be set apart or to continue to be set apart. But there's a lot more to it biblically and theologically than just being set apart in a sense. Wayne Grudem defines sanctification this way. Sanctification is a progressive work of God and man that makes us more and more free from sin and like Christ in our actual lives. Sanctification is a progressive work of God and man that makes us more and more free from sin and like Christ in our actual lives. It's a great definition, I think, of this work, what we might also call progressive sanctification. Right? That, that you are growing progressively uh, away from sin and towards Christ and more like Christ in your life. And, and sometimes we, we're thankful that we're, for the word progressive. <laughs> sometimes it feels a little too progressive, doesn't it? A little too slow. Uh, maybe there's times you felt that it was more fast and quick in your, in your growth. You were maybe feeling on fire and learning a lot and growing a lot. And maybe there's times in your life you feel it's very slow. And it's very progressive. Either way, you are being sanctified as a believer by the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the process and the means by which we grow, by which we change, by which we're putting off this old self that was dead in sin, and we are putting on a new self that's created in Christ Jesus. Remember, he mentioned that earlier. Chapter 2, verse 10, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. So we are, we are changing and continually being shaped by Christ. 
J.C. Ryle, in his masterful book, Holiness, I mean, I, I always say it's in the top 10 books, is the book Holiness by J.C. Ryle. He says about sanctification that it is one which many, I fear, dislike exceedingly. He says, some even turn from it with scorn and disdain. Uh, The very last thing they would like is to be a saint or a sanctified man. Yet the subject does not deserve to be treated in this way. It is not an enemy but a friend. So don't be fearful when we talk about sanctification and being changed and set apart and becoming more of a saint, more of a holy person. As Ryle says, it's not our enemy, it is our friend. The subject of sanctification is our friend, and we are well off even to study it. I would even encourage you to study this subject itself. How do you grow in Christ? Paul explains it, and he details it here, but he also places great weight upon us starting especially here in verse 17. Now this I say and testify in the Lord, Paul says. And we can feel, I think, the the urgency, the weight of what Paul is saying now as he explains this process of sanctification. In fact, the truth is we cannot afford to be ignorant about it. We have to know these things. Uh, Yes, God is working in us, and there is an element of mystery in how he does that. He uses the word, he uses prayer, he uses the church, he uses obedience, he uses trials and tribulations. But we do need to understand what we need to do in regards to our own sanctification. Because again, as Paul is getting at, he wants us to live a gospel-worthy life. Doesn't he back in chapter 4, verse 1, to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, worthy of the calling to which you've been called, worthy of what he's done on your behalf? And so to understand this can help us walk in a more worthy way. We must understand, in a sense, the mechanics of Christian growth. And not that sanctification is merely some formulaic kind of mechanical process where We just kind of check things off and we make sure things are running and we are automatically sanctified and made more holy. And It's not that kind of process, but nevertheless, there are details that we do need to know and be involved with. A few more thoughts here on the meaning of sanctification. Sanctification is not to be confused with justification. Sanctification is our growth and our change Now that we are made alive in Christ, now that we are believers, but justification has already taken place for the believer. For the believer, once they are saved by the grace of God, they are also justified before God. Justification is to be made right with God. It is to be declared to be righteous. And that's an amazing subject in of itself. Even though when you looked in the mirror this morning, you still realize you're a sinner. That hasn't changed. God hasn't glorified you yet. Um, And yet justification says you are declared righteous. You are declared right before God in heaven, even though you're still a sinner because of what Christ has done. It is God saying you are now right with him. And justification is only a work of God. It's not anything that we can do. It's not any, we don't have any part in our own justification. Justification is purely a work of God, whereas Grudem defined for us sanctification is both a work of God and man. And this is why we need to understand sanctification as well, because you have a part in your own sanctification. That's how God's designed it. You know, again, I I say this often, but God did not save you and justify you and then bring you to heaven, did he? He left you here. He left you with sin. He left you in a fallen world. And by design, wants you to participate in sanctification, in his wisdom and in his goodness. 
The Roman Catholic Church there gets all of this terribly wrong. Uh, they mix the two of justification and sanctification. They teach that our sanctification, in a sense, aids in our justification. That somehow in your Christian life, they may say, you're still earning your position with God, earning your justification, being made righteous before God while you live your life. Even after death, in purgatory, you're accomplishing that and bettering your position. That's their teaching. But that's because they don't get justification and sanctification right. Justification, friends, is only a work of God. Your regeneration and and, and coming to life, that is only by the grace of God. It's nothing we conjure up. It's nothing we earn over a period of time. It is only the work of God. Whereas sanctification is a... uh, a joint effort between God and us. He includes us in that process. The only man who can be sanctified is the man who is already justified. And justified by simply faith in Christ. There is no such thing as a person who's sanctified who's not been justified. And his sanctification in no way creates or aids his justification. At the end of the day, to make it as simple as it is, because this might get complex and it shouldn't be, for salvation, you trust purely Christ and Christ alone and what he has done for you. And that's the end of that. There's there's no of us. We we looked at that in chapter 2, right? Paul was so clear. Talking about God being rich in mercy, which he loved us even when we were dead. And a dead person cannot contribute anything to anyone or to themselves. And he says there, we were made alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated with him. And he says there in verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Just in case you missed what he said earlier, he repeats himself. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of whom? God, right? I mean, he he makes it crystal clear over and over. The only reason you're made alive and you're regenerated and you have new life and you're saved is because God chose to do that. That is the only reason. And sanctification is the result of this new life. Now that you're made alive and you're justified, now that you're born again, you begin this process of what we call sanctification. Turn back to chapter 4, verse 17. This is where he begins. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. I know you're a Gentile, by the way. I'll explain that later. In the futility of their minds. So here, Paul is saying here, this this process begins. You're, You're now to walk in a certain way. You know, and dead people don't walk. I don't care what movies they put out from Hollywood. It's not true. (laughs) I haven't seen it at least. But dead people aren't walking around. Living people are. You're alive now. Now, Paul says, you're to walk. And you're to walk differently than that former lifestyle, that life that you did have when you were dead in your sin. You're to be changed. You're to be a different person. So justification and sanctification are both the work of God by the grace of God. And in that way, they're similar. And and in that way, they're also both necessary, but they are also vastly different in that in the work of justification, it's God alone. But in the work of sanctification, you're part of this. You've signed up even though you don't know if you've signed up for this. You may have signed up for the thing on Tuesday. But you're signed up for sanctification. Now God involves you, and this is what Paul is going to show us. But it's important to cover that area. I know, you know, interesting how many testimonies I hear. Uh, I think it would be right to say probably half of them that I've heard are people who have come from the Roman Catholic Church. And so we, we cannot be confused on the issue that 
Um, the salvation we have is only a work of God. Jesus Christ died once and for all for sinners. The work is complete. The book of Hebrews emphasizes this. He's sat down is an emphasis in the book of Hebrews. The work is finished. And there is no longer a need for sacrifice or a priestly line because he's our high priest. But the work of sanctification is involving us. Joel Beakey says, Sanctification is the work of God by which he makes people holy. We were just singing the battle hymn of the Republic. I never noticed that line, that he died to make men holy. That really captures it, doesn't it? And we'll talk about this as well, that Jesus died in order to change us. He didn't die only to forgive us and leave us in the state that we were in. He died to actually change us, to make us more like himself. Thomas Watson said, It is a principle of grace, savingly wrought, whereby the heart becomes holy and is made after God's heart. That's a great definition of sanctification. It is a principle of grace, savingly wrought, whereby the heart becomes holy and is made after God's heart. You know, like David was a man after God's own heart. Uh, God is making our hearts to be like his. It is to be changed from glory to glory, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. It is to be conformed to the image of God's Son, Romans 8, verse 29. It is to press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, Philippians 3.14. It is to fight the good fight of faith, 2 Timothy 4, 7. This is what sanctification is all about. It's a life of change for the Christian. Well, let's look at three principles then regarding sanctification and really, friends, just from verse 17. (laughs) There's a lot in verse 17. I'm always overly ambitious. We're going to get through this whole section. And I guess there's no rush, is there? Verse 17, now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. Paul states this with urgency and importance, doesn't he? You can feel it in Paul there after a focus on regeneration and new life. You are dead. You're now made alive. You're made alive together. Praise the Lord. He he ends with that prayer. May you understand better the love of Christ. And now what does he say here? Now I say. Now I testify in the Lord. It's kind of like he he grabs our collars and he gets our attention, doesn't he? You know, we need that. We can be easily distracted. (laughs) And he, he arrests our attention here. Something very important. We must always remind ourselves that chapter 4 comes after chapter 2. So he told us that we have been regenerated in chapter 2. We've been born again, to use the language of John in the Gospel of John. And he told us in detail what God did there, being rich in mercy, saving us, redeeming us, um, giving us new life. He even began that in chapter 1. Chapter 2, verse 1, you were once dead in your sins, He says there, but verse 5, even though we were dead in our sin, he made us alive together in Christ. He gave us new life. Only then, at that moment, and after that moment, do we begin sanctification. In fact, sanctification begins the moment you are regenerated. There's no period of time between those two points. And the only individual who grows is the one who's made alive, right? I mean, some of our young parents are experiencing this and the joys of losing sleep as they watch their child growing and they're feeding and they're maturing because they're alive. It's, this is for the, the sake for the Christian as well. Once regenerated by the Spirit, once given life in Christ, once raised from the dead, now God is growing them. He's growing you. And holiness is taking place. Change is taking place. I mean, maybe sometimes you've had people tell you who see you years later, they say, well, hey, you're different. 
you're not the same person I remember. And you're, you're thankful, I hope, <laughs> that you're not the same person you once were to your friends when you were younger. And so God is doing this work all beginning at the point of regeneration. Change begins then. Once you are born again, God begins to work in your heart. He begins to work in you in shaping and molding you. Wayne Grudem says this initial step in sanctification involves a definite break from the ruling power and love of sin so that the believer is no longer ruled or dominated by sin and no longer loves to sin. So there's a change that's taking place here. Even as Paul is giving this instruction, he's he's telling this to people who have new life, who are no longer under the dominion and the power of sin as they once were. Paul argues that in Romans chapter 6. You've been been freed from the slavery and the dominion of sin. Now you serve righteousness. You serve Jesus. You you have the Spirit, as he argues in Romans 6, 7, and 8. But there's this, this freedom. You know, we talk about freedom this week, and we blow up stuff in our neighborhood. You know, we do this every year. But we really understand what freedom is, don't we, as believers? We understand what it means to be free. Does that mean there's no more sin within? No. There's still sin within. There is a view out there, a perfectionist view that says that a believer can reach perfection in this life and no longer struggle with sin. And I'd like to hang out with someone like that for a week, drive with them to their commute to work and see how they do. See if they really have been freed from the struggle with sin. Uh, Or ask their spouse or their child and see what they say. It's not true, right? We're not freed in that sense that we don't have sin anymore, but we are freed from the power and dominion of sin, and now God is beginning this work of sanctification. And it's literally Paul's first exhortation in the book of Romans. You go through almost six chapters, and there's no commands by Paul. He's just telling you things. And in chapter 6, verse 11, he says this, So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. The first thing he tells them is, consider the fact, believe the fact, that you are freed from the power and the dominion of sin. You You have to consider that. You have to think that. You have to believe that. Though you were once dead in sin, you are now dead to sin. Once without life, now you are alive in God. So consider this to be true. Believe this and live in light of that reality. And being set free from spiritual death and spiritual slavery, you begin to change. Verse 17 here in Ephesians 4, you begin to walk. You begin to walk, you know, and it it might feel like baby steps and it probably is initially but you begin to walk because of what Christ has done in freeing you from death and from sin and giving you life every believer born again by the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit begins this process of sanctification there is no such thing as a believer who is not going to be sanctified just as Paul argues in Romans 8 there's no such thing as as a believer who does not have the Holy Spirit. Every believer is given the Spirit, and every believer gets to participate in sanctification. Sanctification always follows regeneration. And so Paul, in the flow and the logic of his letter, he begins to deal uh, to detail this process of sanctification. So that's the first principle there. Secondly, Sanctification is an absolute necessity. Sanctification is an absolute necessity. And I've already been saying this to some degree. Scripture is clear, including here in Ephesians, that everyone born again will be sanctified. You know, he's, he's writing a letter to a church. And he addresses later everybody in that church. Husbands, fathers, Parents, workers, slaves, masters. He addresses the children. He's addressing everybody in here 
but he knows every believer needs to hear the rest of the letter because we're all being sanctified. We need to even know what we need to do. You know, how do I live now? What do I do in the workplace? What do I, how do I relate to my master back then? Now it would be your boss who f- might feel like a master <laughs> and you feel like a slave. You might relate to that. How do I do that? What do I do, Lord? He provides all of that because he's making the assumption these are believers. And they're all being sanctified. There are no exceptions. God is sanctifying you as a believer. Even if you don't feel you are being sanctified. There is no such thing, by the way, as a carnal Christian, as sometimes it's called. And my understanding of that idea is someone who professes faith in Christ but can live decades not wanting Christ at all in their life. Not living at all for Christ. But they can go back and say, well, you know, when I was 17, I professed faith in Jesus at a youth tent revival. Well, doubt that to be true. All those who are justified will be sanctified. Yes, Christians can live in unrepentance, They can do that for extended period of time. Even even David did. The psalmist talks about how God was crushing him and, and, and working in him. But there's no such thing as someone who is saved and justified but doesn't live for the Lord the rest of their lives. Yes, this change will be slow. It will be gradual generally. Sometimes it may be faster. But I think generally over the long haul, Your sanctification is a gradual, it's a progressive process, but you will be changed nonetheless. And there's great assurance in knowing that, that the Lord is not going to give up on us. He's going to continue to work in you and through you. We begin like newborn babies who long for the pure spiritual milk of the word, 1 Peter 2, 1, and progress and hopefully eat solid food as a believer that we don't fall into the state that the Hebrews writer found his congregation, Hebrews 5, verse 12, when he writes about this, we have much to say and it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. We can fall into that, can't we? All of us. Can, can fall into that. Where now we're, we're feeding on milk again. Uh, now we're straying from the Lord. Now we're relying upon our own strength and not the Lord. We need to grow in Christ. And it's an absolute necessity. He says, Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. Paul is saying this is not optional. You must walk in a gospel-worthy manner. You must walk differently than you once did. Sanctification is an absolute necessity for the Christian. And we grow in Christ by applying ourselves, as we're going to see, putting off the old man, putting on the new. It is such a necessity that Paul, I I think he's, he's communicating this in verse 17 before he unpacks what it looks like in in all its parts. Because he says now this, I say, and I testify in whom? What does verse 17 say? In the Lord. I mean, this is like an emphasis upon, an emphasis upon, an emphasis. And then to say, you must. Sanctification is necessary. He says, I say. he's, He's kind of pressing down now his apostolic authority. Maybe trying to make us feel a little bit uncomfortable, but he's certainly trying to wake us up. A sense of urgency. And he does so in the Lord. Now, Paul has already been speaking in the Lord, hasn't he? Starting in chapter 1, verse 1, when he introduces who he is. He's already speaking in the Lord there. He's not saying, okay, all that I've said so far, that's kind of my opinion. Now, this is the Lord's opinion. <laughs> okay, well, this is really important then. Far more important than the previous three chapters. No, he's, he's adding this emphasis that you might wake up and hear what he has to say. I'm saying this, and I'm testifying, I'm saying this in the Lord. 
That's the importance of it. It's a divine necessity, a, a divine urgency, a divine imperative that you put off this old self. By the way, as we'll see, the old self likes to cling closely. The old self likes to jump on your back. The old self likes to hang out and hang around. It's a very difficult process. Sanctification is such a necessity that the Hebrews writer says in Hebrews 11 verse 14 that we are to strive for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Oh, without holiness, we cannot see the Lord. So holiness is, it's not optional. Growth is not optional. We are to become holy because he is holy, right? Peter says. In fact, it is necessary so that one day we can see the Lord. You could say this theologically, God is preparing you to see the Lord, (laughs) to see him to be in his presence, to stand in front of him. And that's a, that's a sobering reality. It's, it's a joyful reality on the one hand. It's sobering on the other. But he's preparing you for that day, sanctifying you, making you more holy, changing you. It's absolutely part of this entire salvation that he's given you which includes regeneration and it includes justification. It includes adoption as we saw there in chapter 1. It includes sanctification. And as he says in Romans 8, it includes glorification. That one day he'll finish all of this and he'll remove sin, he'll glorify you, he'll stand blameless in his presence with great joy. But friends, holiness is absolutely necessary. Because he is holy. Therefore, sanctification is absolutely necessary. J.C. Ryle, again, said, If the Bible be true, it is certain that unless we are sanctified, we shall not be saved. And he's right. Why? Because the Bible says we must be sanctified. That's part of the salvation, in a sense, that God has given us. He says, every Christian, every man and woman in Christendom experiences these three, J.C. Ryle says, justification, regeneration, and sanctification. All of those. Isn't Isn't that a blessing? Those are all gifts from the Lord. I know you have a part in your sanctification, as I've argued, but it's still a gift from the Lord. He, Ryle says, that lacks any one of these three things is not a true Christian in the sight of God. And dying in that condition will not be found in heaven and glorified in the last day. He's arguing simply, there is no such thing as a Christian who's justified but never sanctified. Right? In other words, every believer, by the grace of God, will be sanctified and eventually will be glorified. All are a gift of God and all are necessary And all are what it means to be a Christian. And to say sanctification isn't necessary is to say Christ isn't going to do what He's promised to do in your life. He's promised to make you holy. He's promised to work with you in this great salvation, Philippians 2. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work within you. He's doing this work. He not only died to deliver you from your sins, he died to deliver you from the dominion of sin. You see? He's not only our righteousness, but he is making us more righteous like him. Paul tells us, look look with me at Titus chapter 2. I think this is such a helpful verse. Titus 2 verse 14 Speaking of Jesus, whom he calls the grace of God in verse 11. Jesus, verse 14, who gave himself for us, notice what he says, to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Why did he die? Yes, to rescue you from the wrath of God. 
Yes, to reconcile you to God, to make you righteous before God, to save you from your sins. But he also died to purify you. You see that? To purify for himself a people for his own possession. Who are zealous for what? Good works. Sounds like Ephesians 2.10, doesn't it? We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. This is his purpose, not only to forgive you and to make you right, but he wants to change you. He wants you to be somebody who can glorify God in your life, who can do actual, actual good works, which you could never do beforehand, before you were saved. This is exciting. He is purifying for himself a people. This is why he gave himself for you. He gave himself for you to change you. I think no wonder Paul, back in Ephesians 4, is really pressing this upon his people there. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you no longer walk as you once did. I testify in the Lord that you be a different person, that you live differently than you once did. And one day, as the great apostle says in Colossians 1.22, he will present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. He will actually complete this work. Aren't there days you wake up? Maybe it's Mondays generally. And you think, first of all, sanctification is going way too slow. And secondly, I don't know if he's going to finish this work. I know what Philippians tells me. He's supposed to finish this work that he started. But sometimes it's a struggle in our faith, isn't it? But he promises that he will finish this work. One day he'll present you holy, and it says there in Colossians, blameless. Which shows us not our power and ability. It shows us his power and what he can do. One day this work of sanctification will be complete when he glorifies us and we stand in his presence. You know, we should have t-shirts that say, work in progress. <laughs> right? That's what it feels like, isn't it? It's true. But we need to heed Paul's weighty appeal and exhortation. I say, I testify to you. I do so in the Lord. This is, in, this is the word of the Lord, Paul says. That you must walk differently. That you live out this new life that you be sanctified. Let me give you a third and final principle here. This is basically warming you up for the passage. And it's number three. Sanctification is the Lord's will for your life. Sanctification is the Lord's will for your life. Yes, it's, it's necessary. It's part of being a Christian. But I want to go a little further and be more practical with you. It is actually God's will for you. I am, in a sense, restating what I have already said, but I want to drive this home. He says, I testify, notice here, in the Lord. It's like he's saying, this is what is the will of God. <laughs> this is what he wants. He wants you to no longer walk as the Gentiles do. He wants you to be different. I mean, let's, let's be honest. It certainly would be Nice to get a direct word from the Lord, wouldn't it? Direct revelation from the risen Savior. If that happened, we wouldn't be like some of the authors in these popular books who are shaving when Jesus talks to them or whatever it is. It's so casual. We would be terrified. We would fall as John did as a dead man. But we would really like that, I'm sure. But here we have it, don't we? Here, Paul says, I'm saying in the Lord. And what is the word of the Lord to you today? That you no longer walk as you once did. The will of the Lord is your sanctification. You must no longer walk as what was described there in chapter 2. As someone who is dead in their sin, under the power of the prince of the air. Um, you were an enemy of God. That's not you anymore. We can spend a lot of our time searching for the will of God in our life. Where do I live? Whom do I marry? What career do I take? 
But friends, here we find the clear will of the Lord. We find we must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. We must no longer live that old, dead, unsanctified life we once did where we suppress the truth and unrighteousness, where we didn't give thanks to God, where we once lived when God found us and saved us. He saved us from that life. Now we must live differently. God's will here is loud and clear. His will is that you change. His will is that you begin a new walk, that you walk a different path, that you act as a different person. Actually, as we'll see, you act as you really are now in Christ, as you put on the new self. And you continually must be putting off the old self. And you must continually be putting on the new self, as he's going to tell us in verse 24, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. He's going to tell us, friends, you need to live out who you already are in Jesus. So as Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. What is the will of God for you? What is God's will specifically for your life? That you be sanctified. That you grow and you change in Christ's likeness. And this is why he died for you. And this is why he lives for you. Paul begins to unfold this great subject here in Ephesians. He says, now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for what you have done on our behalf by giving us new life. <clears throat> we were once dead in our sin. We were we were under the power and the dominion of sin, slaves to unrighteousness. More than that, we've discovered, Lord, that we were under the power of Satan himself, the prince of this world. Lord, that we were held captive. We, we were not free in any way. And so we rejoice that you freed us. It's for freedom that you have set us free. You have now transferred us from that domain of darkness to your kingdom. You're now our master. And you're good and you're perfect. And you've given us life. You've given us your spirit. You've given us your word, which is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And Lord, we thank you that you're not done that you continue to sanctify us and to change us and to work in us. And Lord, that's our desire, that's our prayer this morning. Would you please work your grace in our hearts? Would you draw us closer to yourself? Would you change us to become more like you? Would you help us to put off the old man? We pray in your name, amen.